When you look at the vast and timeless desert of Egypt, the word Kemet might not immediately come to mind. Yet this term, which means black land in the ancient Egyptian language, was once used to describe this area, highlighting the fertile soil along the banks of the Nile River, the lifeblood of the civilization we know today as ancient Egypt. But were the Kemites merely skilled farmers and pyramid builders, or was there more to them? Could there possibly be connections to other worldly beings? The term Kemites stems from Kemet, which translates to the black land in the ancient Egyptian language. This phrase illustrates the contrast between the fertile black soil of the Nile River's banks and the harsh surrounding desert, often referred to as Deshret or the Red Land. However, the term Kemet signifies far more than a geographical landscape. It represented a civilization that was one of the most enduring and influential in human history. The people of Kemet, the Kemetes, constructed a culture that has contributed a great deal to the world in various fields such as architecture, mathematics, science, and art. The Kemites were builders of an incredible magnitude. They are known for the creation of the pyramids, grand burial structures for their pharaohs, and the Sphinx, one of the most iconic monuments worldwide. The sheer precision and scale of these constructions are an enduring testament to their engineering prowess and architectural ingenuity. They were also highly sophisticated in their administrative systems, maintaining detailed records of their pharaohs, political affairs and religious rituals. These have been crucial in enabling us to piece together the history and societal structure of Kemet. The religion of the Kemites was intricately woven into every aspect of their daily life, they had a polytheistic belief system with a pantheon of gods and goddesses, each overseeing different aspects of life and nature. These religious beliefs not only guided their moral code, but also played a significant role in their understanding of the world, life, death and the afterlife. In the realm of art, Kemets were masterful. Their sculptures, paintings and pottery were not only beautiful but also carried significant symbolic meaning. These artifacts provide a window into their values, beliefs and everyday life, contributing to our understanding of this extraordinary civilization. The association between the Kemites and extraterrestrial theories mainly originates from their incredible achievements in construction, astronomy and science that appear to far surpass what would have been achievable with the technology thought to be available to them. This includes, most notably, the construction of the Pyramids of Giza and the Sphinx, which showcase an astounding level of precision and understanding of complex mathematics and engineering. One element of this theory focuses on the construction of the pyramids, specifically the Great Pyramid of Giza. The pyramid's alignment with the magnetic North Pole, the precise dimensions and ratios correlating with complex mathematics and astronomical phenomena, and the extraordinary undertaking of constructing such a monument with huge stones all have led some to question whether the Kemites had help from technologically advanced extraterrestrial beings. Moreover, the precise alignment of the Pyramids of Giza with the stars in the Belt of Orion has also been used as evidence for this theory. This alignment, along with various other astronomical alignments found in their architecture and art, suggests a deep understanding of the cosmos that seems uncannily advanced for the time. Another aspect of Kemet's civilization that feeds into this theory is their mythology and religious beliefs. Ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs and artwork are full of references to sky gods, powerful beings who descended from the stars and strange objects seen in the sky. Proponents of the ancient astronaut theory suggest that these are not myths or symbols, but literal depictions of extraterrestrial visitors. It's worth noting, however, that these theories often come under scrutiny. Many scholars argue that these theories underestimate the ingenuity, intelligence and skills of ancient human civilizations. They point out that with an understanding of simple machines, human labor and time, the Kemites could have achieved these remarkable constructions on their own. Whether or not the Kemites had extraterrestrial help is a matter of personal belief. What is undeniable is the awe-inspiring and influential legacy that Kemet civilization has left behind. Now, diving into the advanced knowledge of the Kemites. Now, this is where things get really interesting. The civilization of Kemet was notably advanced for its time, with numerous achievements in various fields such as astronomy, mathematics, architecture and medicine. Firstly, the Kemites were skilled astronomers. 
Their understanding of celestial bodies was so profound that they were able to develop a calendar that is almost as accurate as the one we use today. Based on the movements of the sun, moon and stars, they formulated a 365-day calendar divided into 12 months. This marked a significant leap in the understanding of timekeeping. Moreover, they developed complex mathematical concepts including fractions and geometric principles, which allowed them to create stunning architectural masterpieces such as the pyramids. They understood principles of engineering, physics and geometry that wouldn't be rediscovered until thousands of years later. In the field of medicine, Kemites demonstrated advanced knowledge too. Papyrus scripts reveal they had knowledge of human anatomy, surgical procedures and even remedies for various ailments. The medical practices were so developed that some even argue they carried out complex procedures like brain surgery. The complexity of these achievements has led some to speculate about a possible extraterrestrial influence. Could such a civilization have gained such advanced knowledge on their own? Or was there external help involved? Theories propose that the Chemites could have had contact with an alien civilization that shared their knowledge with them, sparking the rapid development of their society. But of course, this is all conjecture and the debate continues. Now let's plunge headfirst into one of the most enduring mysteries of the Chemites, the pyramids. The pyramids of Egypt, built by the Chemites, are one of the most recognizable and enigmatic structures of the ancient world. The most famous of them, the Great Pyramid of Giza, is a marvel of engineering and precision that even modern technology struggles to replicate. This Great Pyramid is estimated to consist of over 2.3 million blocks of stone, each weighing an average of 2.5 tons and some even up to 15 tons. The precision of its construction is staggering. Its base is level to within just 2.1 centimeters and the sides are oriented to the cardinal directions within three arc minutes. The construction methodology behind such a mammoth task is an enduring mystery. Several theories have been proposed about how these structures were built, from simple manual labor to complex machines and even supernatural or alien assistance. One of the most prevalent theories is that the Chemites constructed a spiraling ramp to haul the massive stones to the required heights. However, the sheer logistics of such a venture in terms of workforce, resources and time make this theory a subject of debate. More fringe theories have posited that the Chemites had access to advanced technology, perhaps even extraterrestrial. These theories often point to the precision and alignment of the pyramids with celestial bodies, a task that would seemingly require a more advanced understanding of mathematics and astronomy than was available at the time. One of the most fascinating elements of Kemet's rich culture is its art. This isn't simply due to its aesthetic appeal, but more intriguingly, the narratives and depictions that the art encompasses. The Kemetic art includes a wide range of expressive forms, from sculpture and architecture to relief and pottery, and of course, the remarkable hieroglyphic writing system. Looking closer at the artwork, some researchers and theorists have pointed out representations that could potentially denote alien encounters. This is a contentious interpretation and is not universally accepted by historians or Egyptologists, but it certainly makes for a compelling discussion. Among the most cited pieces are the relief depictions found in the Temple of Siti, once in Abydos. This particular relief has stirred controversy as it seems to show objects resembling modern-day helicopters, submarines and even spaceships. How could this be? given that these technologies wouldn't exist for thousands of years after the relief was created. Then there are the depictions of the gods themselves. Many of them, like the sky god Horus, who is represented as a man with the head of a falcon, and the god Ra, who is frequently portrayed traveling through the sky in a sunboat, are theorized by some to symbolize extraterrestrial beings. Critics argue these interpretations are merely a result of pareidolia, the human tendency to perceive meaningful patterns where none actually exist. However, proponents of the alien theory believe that these peculiarities are too significant to dismiss as coincidence. What's clear is that Kemetic art laden with its mystical symbols and cryptic depictions is still a fertile ground for exploration and interpretation. While the Kemetic civilization's feats of engineering, medicine and astronomy were truly remarkable, some believe the alien connection theories are a step too far, an overly speculative leap that discounts the achievements of the ancient Kimites themselves. 
In this segment, we delve into the skepticism and the rational view of these theories. Firstly, it's important to acknowledge that correlation does not imply causation. Yes, there are intriguing overlaps between some ancient Egyptian depictions and what we might interpret as UFOs or alien figures today. But this doesn't necessarily mean that aliens were involved. After all, to the untrained eye, a cloud can resemble a dragon or a castle. But this doesn't make it so. Many experts and historians argue that interpreting the gods and hieroglyphs as aliens or UFOs is a form of cultural reductionism, simplifying complex, symbolic artwork into an anachronistic, literal interpretation. Egyptologists point out that hieroglyphs were highly stylized, symbolic and sacred, often representing ideas or concepts rather than physical entities. The advanced knowledge demonstrated by the Kemites, while certainly impressive, may be more a testament to their sophisticated understanding of mathematics, astronomy and engineering, rather than alien intervention. Remember, the Kemites were one of the longest-lasting civilizations in human history, giving them ample time to develop and refine their knowledge. Finally, there's the issue of Occam's razor, the principle that the simplest explanation is usually the best one. In this case, the simpler explanation is that the Kemites, through hundreds of years of intellectual pursuit, achieved their advancements on their own. While the idea of ancient alien visitations is an exciting theory, it adds a layer of complexity and speculation that isn't necessarily supported by hard evidence. So were the Kimites, the people of the Black Land, the benefactors of alien knowledge? Or were they simply skilled artisans, scientists and builders who utilized their understanding of the world around them to create one of the most enduring and fascinating civilizations in human history? Like the Sphinx, the answer remains enigmatic, silently gazing out into the sands of time. But one thing's for sure, the legacy of the Kamites, whether divinely, extraterrestrially or humanly inspired, continues to captivate us and will likely do so for many millennia to come. Have you ever wondered about the mysteries surrounding the ancient Inca civilization and its astonishing achievements? The Incas, who ruled over one of the largest empires in the Americas, were renowned for their advanced technology, impressive architecture and intricate social structure. In today's exploration, we will delve into the fascinating world of the Incas, examine theories about possible alien or Anunnaki influences, and uncover connections between their majestic structures and the pyramids of Egypt. So strap in and let's embark on a journey back in time to discover the secrets of the Inca Empire. The Inca Empire, also known as Tawantinsuyu, was the largest empire in pre-Columbian America, spanning a vast territory along the Andes mountain range from modern-day Colombia to Chile. The Incas trace their origins back to the mythical founders, Manco Capac and Mama Oclo, who emerged from the sacred lake Titicaca, as commanded by the sun god Inti. Legend has it that Inti sent his children to establish a new civilization and teach the people how to live in harmony with the land. The city of Cusco, which means navel of the world in the Quechua language, was established as the capital of the empire, and it's from here that the Incas embarked on their remarkable journey of expansion and innovation. The Inca civilization arose in the early 13th century, but it wasn't until the reign of Pachacuti in the mid-15th century that the empire began to expand rapidly. Pachacuti is credited with transforming the small city-state of Cusco into a mighty empire through a combination of diplomacy, military conquest and strategic alliances. The Incas had a unique system of governance, with the ruler known as the Sapa Inca considered to be a divine figure, the son of the sun god Inti. The Inca society was highly stratified with a strict hierarchy of nobles, commoners and an extensive bureaucracy. The empire was divided into four provinces, each governed by a high-ranking official known as an Apu. As the empire expanded, the Incas assimilated various cultures and people into their own, often incorporating their religious beliefs, customs and even architectural styles. The Incas were master builders and engineers, leaving behind a legacy of architectural marvels that continue to captivate us today. Let's delve deeper into some of the key aspects of their technology and engineering prowess. Stonework The Incas' extraordinary masonry techniques allowed them to construct massive stone structures without the use of mortar. Their precision is so impressive that even a knife blade cannot fit between the stones. 
This dry stone technique provided excellent stability and durability, as well as seismic resistance which was vital in the earthquake-prone region of the Andes. The Incas ingeniously adapted to the mountainous terrain by developing agricultural terraces known as Andenes. These terraces not only increased the arable land available for farming but also minimized erosion and facilitated irrigation. They built retaining walls and filled them with layers of soil and gravel, which provided excellent drainage and prevented waterlogging. This enabled them to grow crops like potatoes, quinoa and maize at altitudes that would otherwise have been unsuitable for agriculture. The Incas developed an extensive road system known as the Capac Nyan, which stretched for over 25,000 miles throughout the empire. This network of roads facilitated trade, communication, and military movement. They built suspension bridges made of woven grass, which allowed them to cross the many rivers and ravines throughout their territory. These bridges were so innovative that some of them are still in use today. The Incas excelled in hydraulic engineering harnessing the power of water for both agricultural and domestic use. They constructed intricate systems of canals, aqueducts and reservoirs to transport water from mountain springs to their cities, fields and terraced farms. Their knowledge of hydraulics allowed them to create fountains and even plumbing systems within their palaces, providing their inhabitants with fresh water and sanitation. The Incas were skilled astronomers and used their knowledge of celestial events to plan their cities and sacred sites. Many of their structures, such as the Temple of the Sun in Cusco, were aligned with the solstices and equinoxes, allowing them to function as astronomical observatories. This precise orientation also served a religious purpose, as the Incas believed that their deities were closely connected to celestial events. The advanced knowledge and achievements of the Incas have led some to speculate about possible extraterrestrial or Anunnaki influences on their civilization. Here are some reasons why we can speculate this. The Incas' intricate understanding of astronomy, agriculture and engineering has fueled speculation that they may have acquired their knowledge from otherworldly sources. Some suggest that extraterrestrial beings or the Anunnaki, a group of deities from Sumerian mythology, might have shared their advanced technologies with the Incas enabling them to achieve their remarkable feats. Certain artifacts and structures found in the Inca Empire have raised questions about their origins. For example, the twelve-angled stone in Cusco, with its perfectly interlocking edges, has been cited as evidence of advanced machining techniques that were beyond the capabilities of the Incas. Similarly, the megalithic site of Sacsayhuaman, with its colossal stones weighing up to 200 tons, has left some wondering how the Incas managed to transport and fit these massive blocks so precisely without modern equipment. Some proponents of the ancient astronaut theory, which posits that extraterrestrials visited Earth in the distant past and influenced human civilizations, argue that the Incas' advanced knowledge and abilities can be attributed to contact with beings from other planets. They point to similarities between the Inca civilization and other ancient cultures around the world, such as the Egyptians and the Sumerians suggesting that a common extraterrestrial influence might be responsible for their parallel advancements. Inca mythology and religious beliefs also provide some fodder for those seeking connections to extraterrestrials or the Anunnaki. The Incas believed in a pantheon of gods, many of whom were associated with celestial bodies and natural phenomena. The legend of their founders, Manco Capac and Mama Oclo, emerging from Lake Titicaca at the behest of the sun god Inti, can be interpreted as a metaphor for beings descending from the sky or arriving from another world. Although separated by vast distances and distinct cultures, the Incas and ancient Egyptians both managed to achieve remarkable feats of engineering and artistry, which have led some to draw comparisons and look for connections between these two civilizations. Let's explore some of the intriguing similarities and potential links between the Incas and the Egyptians, as well as their connections to other ancient civilizations. The Incas and the Egyptians are both renowned for their monumental architecture, with the Incas constructing impressive structures like Machu Picchu and Sacsayhuaman, and the Egyptians building the iconic pyramids and temples. Both civilizations mastered the art of moving and placing enormous stone blocks with great precision, despite the lack of modern tools and machinery. The similarities in their building techniques have sparked curiosity about potential connections or shared knowledge between these two distant civilizations. 
both the Incas and the Egyptians demonstrated an advanced understanding of astronomy, which they incorporated into their architecture and religious practices. As mentioned earlier, many Inca structures, such as the Temple of the Sun in Cusco, were aligned with the solstices and equinoxes. Similarly, the Great Pyramid of Giza in Egypt is precisely aligned with the cardinal directions, and its layout is believed to be astronomically significant, representing the stars in the constellation Orion. These astronomical alignments have fueled speculation about a shared source of knowledge or influence. Despite the vast geographical distance between the Inca and Egyptian civilizations, there are some intriguing cultural similarities between the two. Both societies were highly stratified, with a divine ruler at the top of the social hierarchy, and they both practiced elaborate rituals and ceremonies to honor their gods. These similarities have led some to theorize that a common origin or influence might explain the parallels between the two civilizations. While there is no concrete evidence to support direct contact between the Incas and the Egyptians, some researchers have proposed that indirect contact or cultural exchange might have occurred through intermediary civilizations. This could have facilitated the sharing of ideas, technologies and artistic styles, leading to the development of similar architectural techniques and cultural practices. As mentioned in the previous segment, some proponents of ancient astronaut theories or Anunnaki influences have pointed to the similarities between the Inca and Egyptian civilizations as evidence of extraterrestrial intervention. They argue that beings from other planets may have visited both cultures and shared their advanced knowledge, leading to the parallel advancements seen in these ancient societies. The Inca Empire, despite its remarkable accomplishments and vast territory, ultimately met its downfall in the 16th century. A combination of factors contributed to the collapse of this once mighty civilization, which we will examine in greater detail. The arrival of Spanish conquistadors in the early 16th century marked the beginning of the end for the Inca Empire. Led by Francisco Pizarro, the Spanish were driven by a desire for wealth and power, as well as a mission to spread Christianity. In 1532, the conquistadors captured the Inca ruler, Atahualpa, and held him for ransom. Despite the Incas paying an enormous amount of gold and silver, the Spanish executed Atahualpa and proceeded to conquer the remaining Inca territories. Prior to the arrival of the Spanish, the Inca Empire was already weakened by a civil war between two brothers, Atahualpa and Huascar, who were vying for the throne after the death of their father, Emperor Huayna Capac. The infighting fractured the empire and left it vulnerable to external threats, ultimately making it easier for the Spanish to establish control. European diseases such as smallpox, measles and influenza were introduced to the Americas by the Spanish and other European explorers. These diseases spread rapidly among the indigenous populations, including the Incas, who had no immunity to these unfamiliar illnesses. It is estimated that between 50% to 90% of the native population perished due to these epidemics, significantly weakening the Inca Empire and its ability to resist the Spanish conquest. The Spanish conquistadors were equipped with advanced weaponry such as steel swords, firearms and cannons, which gave them a significant advantage over the Inca warriors armed with stone and wooden weapons. Additionally, the Spanish cavalry mounted on horses, provided a formidable force that the Incas had never encountered before. The combination of superior weapons and horses allowed the Spanish to overwhelm the Inca forces and gain control over their territories. The Spanish also exploited existing rivalries and discontent among the various indigenous groups within the Inca Empire. Many of these groups, seeking to break free from Inca rule, allied themselves with the Spanish, providing valuable assistance in their conquest. These alliances further weakened the Inca resistance and accelerated the empire's collapse. The downfall of the Inca Empire was the result of a combination of internal strife, foreign invasion and devastating disease. Within a few decades, the once powerful civilization was dismantled and its people subjugated under Spanish rule. However, the legacy of the Inca Empire continues to endure through its impressive architectural achievements, cultural traditions and influence on modern-day South America. I hope you enjoyed our video today. Stay tuned for more interesting developments and as always, thanks for watching. Today, let's travel back in time all the way to ancient Mesopotamia, to the cradle of civilization. Imagine a world where gods walked among mortals, 
where epic heroes battled fearsome beasts, and where the quest for immortality was not just a philosophical question but a literal journey. Welcome to the world of Gilgamesh, a legendary figure whose epic story is one of the earliest and most profound narratives in human history. Are you ready to embark on this epic adventure? Now, the Epic of Gilgamesh isn't a singular cohesive book like we might imagine today. Instead, it's a collection of stories and poems that evolved and changed over time, eventually forming the epic we know today. These tales were inscribed on a series of 12 clay tablets in the Akkadian language, with the most complete version dating to the 7th century BCE from the library of Ashurbanipal in Nineveh. Gilgamesh is a fascinating character. Legend has it he was the king of Uruk, a Sumerian city-state located in modern-day Iraq. Now, Uruk was a big deal back in the day. We're talking about one of the world's first major cities, the origin of writing, and a hub of culture and trade in ancient Mesopotamia. But let's get back to Gilgamesh. He was described as being two-thirds god and one-third human. This unique lineage gave him superhuman strength and wisdom, making him a formidable leader. However, his divine status didn't shield him from human struggles. In fact, much of the epic revolves around Gilgamesh wrestling with the concept of mortality and the limitations of human existence. Interestingly, even though he was a demigod, Gilgamesh was not a perfect ruler. Ancient texts describe him as a tyrant who imposed his will on his subjects. In fact, his behavior was so oppressive that the gods created Enkidu, a wild man, to challenge him and divert his attention from his subjects. Little did the gods know this decision would change the course of Gilgamesh's life in ways they could not predict. The epic of Gilgamesh is not just a tale of adventure, it's a journey into the human condition, exploring themes of friendship, grief, the pursuit of immortality, and the acceptance of our mortal nature. Its narrative is grand and its implications profound, offering a window into the human soul and the complexities of life. The bond between Gilgamesh and Enkidu is one of the most compelling aspects of the epic. Remember, Enkidu was created by the gods as a kind of counterbalance to Gilgamesh's tyrannical rule. Originally, Enkidu lived among the animals in the wilderness, uncorrupted by civilization. However, after a series of events, he was introduced to human society and eventually found his way to Uruk, where he challenged Gilgamesh to a wrestling match. This moment marked a turning point in Gilgamesh's life, the match was fierce, and although Gilgamesh won, he recognized in Enkidu a worthy friend and companion. This was the start of an extraordinary friendship, one that changed Gilgamesh and ultimately shaped his destiny. Together, Gilgamesh and Enkidu embarked on a series of heroic adventures, from slaying the monstrous Humbaba who guarded the cedar forest, to killing the Bull of Heaven sent by the goddess Ishtar as a punishment for rejecting her advances. These exploits showcased their courage, strength and companionship, solidifying their friendship. However, the epic also delves into the profound emotional transformation of Gilgamesh through his relationship with Enkidu. Gilgamesh, who was once an arrogant and self-centered king, began to exhibit empathy, humility and wisdom. This transition is most apparent when Enkidu falls ill and dies as a consequence of their adventures. Enkidu's death sent Gilgamesh into a profound grief and fear of his own mortality. He set out on a quest to find the secret of immortality, a journey that would lead him to the depths of despair and the heights of enlightenment. Through their friendship, Enkidu not only humanized Gilgamesh but also gave him the impetus to embark on the most significant journey of his life. The friendship between Gilgamesh and Enkidu is a testament to the transformative power of companionship a theme that still resonates with us today. Enkidu's death was a turning point for Gilgamesh, sparking a fear of his own mortality. This fear was so overwhelming that it led him on an epic journey to discover the secret of eternal life. Now, this wasn't a simple journey. This was a quest that took Gilgamesh to the ends of the earth, confronting monsters, gods and the depths of his own despair. One of the most memorable parts of this journey is Gilgamesh's encounter with a man who was granted eternal life by the gods. He is often compared to Noah from the Bible, due to the similarities in their stories. Both were warned of a great flood by a god and built a boat to save themselves, their families and all kinds of animals. Gilgamesh hoped to learn the secret of immortality. However, they informed him that immortality was not meant for humans. He told Gilgamesh a story about a plant that could restore youth, 
but even after Gilgamesh retrieved it, the plant was stolen by a serpent while he bathed, symbolizing the futility of his quest. Despite his failures, Gilgamesh's search for immortality is an exploration of a universal human fear and desire, the fear of death and the longing for eternal life. His journey reflects our own struggles with mortality and the realization that death is an inevitable part of life. It's a humbling reminder of our human condition and the impermanence of our existence. Gilgamesh's journey eventually led him back to Uruk, where he found a different kind of immortality. Not through divine intervention or magical plants, but through his deeds, his city, and the stories that would be told about him for thousands of years to come. This, perhaps, is the true message of the epic of Gilgamesh, that our actions, our contributions, and the memories we leave behind are our true immortality. The Epic of Gilgamesh is much more than an adventure story. It's a profound exploration of themes that continue to resonate with us today. The power of friendship, the quest for immortality, the confrontation with mortality, and the human desire to leave a lasting legacy. The friendship between Gilgamesh and Enkidu is central to the narrative, reflecting the power of human connection to shape our lives. Their bond changes Gilgamesh from an arrogant ruler to a compassionate leader, demonstrating how relationships can lead to personal growth and transformation. The theme of mortality is equally prominent. From Enkidu's death to Gilgamesh's quest for immortality, the epic confronts the inevitability of death. It grapples with the human fear of oblivion, our longing for eternal life, and ultimately our acceptance of our mortal condition. The epic of Gilgamesh also explores the desire to leave a lasting legacy. For Gilgamesh, this comes not in the form of immortality, but through his deeds in the city he built. It's a powerful reminder that our actions, our contributions, and the memories we leave behind are our true legacy. The influence of the Epic of Gilgamesh extends far beyond its time. As one of the oldest known works of literature, it has shaped countless narratives and myths that followed. Its themes have found echoes in biblical stories, uh, Greek mythology, and modern literature. It has inspired operas, novels, and films. Its exploration of friendship, mortality, and legacy continues to resonate with us. While Gilgamesh is often described as a mythical hero, he may have been a real person. Some historians believe that Gilgamesh was a historical king of the city of Uruk, who later became a figure of myth and legend. Records from other ancient civilizations mention a king named Gilgamesh, and archaeological evidence suggests that Uruk was an important city in ancient Mesopotamia. In the epic, Gilgamesh is described as being two-thirds god and one-third human. His mother was a goddess, and his father was a mortal king. This divine heritage gives Gilgamesh superhuman strength and physical beauty, but it also sets him apart from other people and leaves him unsatisfied with his mortal life. The epic of Gilgamesh is essentially a journey of self-discovery. After the death of his friend Enkidu, Gilgamesh embarks on a quest to find the secret of immortality. He travels to the ends of the earth, battles supernatural creatures, and even ventures into the underworld. Although he fails to achieve physical immortality, he gains wisdom and understanding about life, death, and the importance of leaving a lasting legacy. One of the most famous parts of the Epic of Gilgamesh is the story of the Great Flood, which predates the biblical story of Noah's Ark by hundreds of years. In the epic, Gilgamesh meets Utnapishtim, a man who was granted immortality by the gods after he and his wife survived a great flood that wiped out the rest of humanity. This story has led some to speculate about possible connections between the two flood narratives. The epic of Gilgamesh has had a lasting impact on literature and culture. Its themes of friendship, the quest for immortality, and the struggle with mortality are still relevant today. The epic has inspired countless other works of literature and has been translated into many languages. It continues to be studied and admired for its rich symbolism, complex characters, and exploration of universal human experiences. Early in the epic, Gilgamesh is portrayed as a tyrant. His strength and vigor lead him to oppress the people of Uruk. He sets young men to endless labor, competes with them in sports to the point of exhaustion, and disrupts families. This behavior sets the stage for the creation of Enkidu, initially a wild man, who is civilized and becomes a match for Gilgamesh, serving both as a friend and a balance to his excessive energy. Dreams and their interpretations play a crucial role in the epic of Gilgamesh. 
For instance, before meeting Enkidu, Gilgamesh has prophetic dreams that are interpreted by his mother. Later, during their journey to the cedar forest to confront the demon Humbaba, both Gilgamesh and Enkidu experience ominous dreams. These dream sequences highlight the significance of divine intervention and fate in the characters' lives. The Epic of Gilgamesh is one of the earliest known examples of literature. It's written in a poetic form known as epic poetry and is composed of Sumerian verses. The influence of the Epic of Gilgamesh on subsequent literary traditions, especially the Homeric epics, the Iliad and the Odyssey, has been noted by many scholars. The theme of a hero's journey, friendship and quest for immortality are motifs that continue in many forms of literary tradition. For centuries, the Epic of Gilgamesh was forgotten until archaeological excavations in the mid-19th century unearthed the ancient city of Nineveh, including the library of Assyrian king Ashurbanipal. Among the thousands of clay tablets, scholars found the Epic of Gilgamesh. It took decades to decipher, translate and understand the epic, and it wasn't until the late 20th century that a relatively complete and accurate version of the story was available to the public. The rediscovery of this ancient epic has provided invaluable insights into ancient Mesopotamian culture and literature. And there you have it, the Epic of Gilgamesh, a tale of friendship, a quest for immortality, a confrontation with the inevitable reality of death and the human desire to leave a lasting legacy. It's a story that has shaped our collective imagination for millennia and its themes continue to resonate in our own lives. So, next time you ponder your legacy, your mortality, or the power of your relationships, remember the tale of Gilgamesh and his epic journey. It's a testament to the enduring power of stories and the timeless nature of the human condition. Do you ever wonder how much truth lies beneath the tales of old? Ancient myths and legends filled with gods, heroes, and fantastical beasts often seem too extraordinary to hold any factual basis. Yet there are instances where archaeology, history and science have unveiled truths hidden within these tales. Yes, some ancient myths have a kernel of reality within their layers of symbolism and metaphor. Today we are going to delve into seven fascinating cases where myth intertwines with history, where the lines between fact and fiction blur and ancient stories reveal their true colors. The city of Troy, famous in Homer's Iliad, was once considered purely fictional. A tale to fascinate listeners and readers. The city was described as grand, filled with mighty warriors and noble kings, and the setting for the legendary Trojan War. The Greek hero Achilles, the Trojan prince Hector, and the beautiful Helen. They were all characters in this drama, but could it be that these characters were not just part of an epic poem, but people who once lived and breathed? In the 19th century, archaeologist Heinrich Schliemann became fascinated with the idea that the Homeric legends had a basis in historical fact. Rather than dismissing the Iliad as mere fiction, Schliemann used it as a map. He followed the detailed descriptions and geographical clues that Homer had left in his text. His obsession brought him to Hisalik, a site in modern-day Turkey. In Hisalik, Schliemann began to dig. His excavations revealed a multi-layered city one that had been built and rebuilt over the centuries. Artifacts dating back to the Bronze Age were found and the layout of the city matched that described in Homer's epic. The walls of the city, the gates, the placement of buildings, it all pointed to one conclusion. This was the site of the ancient city of Troy. Critics questioned Schliemann's methods and interpretations. They argued that his desire to find Troy may have led him to see what he wanted to see, but subsequent excavations by other archaeologists have supported Schliemann's claim. While it's challenging to prove that the Trojan War, as described by Homer, actually occurred, there's no longer any doubt that a city existed at Hisalik, a city that fits the description and timeline of Homer's Troy. Let's step into the ancient city of Babylon, one of the most famous cities of the ancient world and home to one of the Seven Wonders, the Hanging Gardens. This marvel is wrapped in an enigmatic aura, largely because despite numerous historical accounts of its existence, no physical evidence of the gardens has ever been found. But wait, how can something so grand, so monumental, simply vanish without a trace? The Hanging Gardens were said to be an architectural masterpiece, a testament to human ingenuity and a challenge to Mother Nature herself. They were purportedly built by King Nebuchadnezzar II, 
around 600 BC for his wife Amitis, who was homesick for the lush green landscapes of her homeland media. It's like if you can't go to the mountain, bring the mountain to you. But this mountain was a little more than a mound of earth. This was a spectacular terrace garden filled with exotic plants and trees, adorned with intricate irrigation systems. Historians believe that the gardens were tiered, much like a ziggurat, with each level teeming with a diverse array of flora. The plants were not rooted in the earth directly, but in a roofed area where a complex irrigation system fed water from the Euphrates River. This marvel of engineering, essentially a primitive form of hydroponics, is a testament to the advanced understanding of engineering and horticulture by the Babylonians. The hanging gardens must have been a sight to behold. Imagine a city in the desert, its arid beige landscape broken by a towering structure teeming with greenery, a beacon of life and color cascading down in tears, a spectacle of nature suspended in the air. It was a marvel that, even in the absence of physical evidence, has left an indelible mark on the annals of human civilization. However, recent research has suggested that the hanging gardens may not have been located in Babylon at all. Dr. Stephanie Daly, an Assyriologist from the University of Oxford, posits that the gardens were actually located in the Assyrian city of Nineveh. She bases her theory on a retranslation of ancient texts and points out that Babylon was often used in texts to refer generically to any area of Mesopotamia. Ah, King Midas, a character from ancient Greek mythology known far and wide for his ability to turn everything he touched into gold, aptly named the Golden Touch. This might sound like a superpower to most, but as the tale unfolds, we learn that it's not all it's cracked up to be. But where does this story come from and how does it stand up to the facts? King Midas was a historical figure, a Phrygian king who reigned in the 8th century BC. The ancient Greeks believed he was the son of Gordaeus and Cybele, the goddess of fertility. So far, so historical, right? But here's where it gets a little golden. According to legend, Midas helped the drunken Silenus, a companion of the god Dionysus, back home. In gratitude, Dionysus offered to grant Midas a single wish. Overwhelmed with greed, Midas wished for everything he touched to turn into gold. At first, Midas was overjoyed. The ability to generate infinite wealth with a simple touch seemed like a dream come true. But the dream rapidly turned into a nightmare. When he attempted to eat, his food turned into inedible gold. When he tried to drink, his water transformed into molten gold. Even his beloved daughter, whom he accidentally touched, turned into a golden statue. His blessing was, in fact, a curse. Stricken with despair, he begged Dionysus to remove his golden touch. The god agreed, instructing Midas to wash in the river Pactolus to reverse the enchantment. But here's where the story takes a fascinating turn. The river Pactolus, located in what is now modern Turkey, was renowned in ancient times for its rich deposits of gold. Even today, gold dust can be found in its waters. Was this the result of some geological phenomenon? Or could it be that there's some truth to the myth of King Midas after all? What's more, archaeological evidence suggests that the Kingdom of Phrygia was known for its wealth and craft in working with gold. The Midas Mound burial site in Gordian Turkey, named for the legendary king, contained a wealth of golden artifacts when it was excavated in the 1950s. The concept of a cataclysmic flood that wipes out most of life on Earth is a common thread in many ancient cultures, leading us to wonder could this possibly be grounded in some historical reality? We have the biblical account of Noah's Ark, but there are also similar tales from the ancient Sumerians, Greeks, Hindus, Chinese and Native Americans among others. Even in an era before global communication, this story seems to have been replicated in cultures thousands of miles apart. So could these flood myths be more than just stories? In the Epic of Gilgamesh, one of the oldest known works of literature dating back to ancient Sumeria, we encounter the story of Utnapishtim. Utnapishtim was warned by the god Enki of a coming flood and instructed to build a boat to save himself, his family and all the animals. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? The parallels between this story and the biblical account of Noah are uncanny. In Greece, we have the myth of Deucalion and Pyrrha, who were the only survivors of a great deluge sent by an angry Zeus. In Hindu mythology, there's the story of Manu who builds a boat to survive a flood that engulfs the earth. These stories, despite originating from different cultures and time periods, share a remarkable similarity. 
It's easy to dismiss these tales as coincidental or symbolic, but geological evidence suggests that large-scale flooding did occur in various parts of the world at different times. For instance, around 5600 BC, a catastrophic event known as the Black Sea Deluge may have flooded a vast area of land. Another fascinating theory revolves around the end of the last ice age, around 10,000 BC, when melting ice caps would have caused sea levels to rise significantly, potentially submerging coastal civilizations and giving rise to flood legends. In North America, there's evidence of the Missoula floods, a series of cataclysmic floods that occurred between 15,000 and 13,000 years ago at the end of the last ice age. These floods, caused by the periodic rupturing of ice dams, were of such a scale that they dramatically altered the landscape of parts of Washington, Oregon, and Idaho. So, while we can't say for certain that any one of these flood myths is a direct account of these events, the geological evidence does suggest that our ancient ancestors had to deal with catastrophic floods. Their collective memory of these terrifying events may have been passed down through generations, slowly morphing into the flood myths we know today. The idea of a great flood, it seems, may not be entirely mythical after all. It's a fascinating testament to the way humans, across cultures and across time, make sense of the natural world and its sometimes catastrophic events. The ancient city of Hilak, often referred to as the real-life Atlantis, is a fascinating tale of an entire city that supposedly disappeared overnight. The city was an important center of the Achaean civilization, predating Athens and holding significant power and influence in the region. It was famed for its sanctuary of Poseidon, the god of the sea, earthquakes and horses. The story goes that one fateful winter night in 373 BC, the city was obliterated. But this was no ordinary destruction. According to ancient texts, the city sank into a lagoon, disappearing beneath the waves in a single night, following a combination of a powerful earthquake and a subsequent tsunami. The city, its buildings and its inhabitants were lost beneath the sea, leaving no trace on the surface. The event was so catastrophic that it was said to have inspired the philosopher Plato's account of Atlantis, but was Helike just a myth? For centuries, the story was treated as such, until modern archaeologists decided to investigate. In the late 20th century, a team led by Greek archaeologist Dora Katsanopoulou launched an expedition to find the lost city. After a lengthy search in 2001, they finally found something remarkable. Ruins submerged in a lagoon near the village of Rizomelos, including a large building with archaic walls, classical ceramic fragments, and even bronze artifacts, all dated back to when Helica was supposed to have existed. The findings suggested that the city had been struck by a massive earthquake which liquefied the ground, a process known as soil liquefaction. This, coupled with the tsunami that followed, would have swallowed up the city, much as the ancient texts described. Excavations are still ongoing, but every uncovered artifact adds credibility to a story once thought to be a myth. When we think of the Amazons, images of fierce, independent warrior women might spring to mind thanks to Greek mythology. These women were said to have lived apart from men, only interacting with them for procreation. They were described as equals to men in physical agility and courage, legendary for their skills in battle and their ruthlessness. But how much of this was myth and how much was reality? Ancient Greek historians such as Herodotus wrote detailed accounts of the Amazons, but for a long time these stories were treated as just that, stories. The idea of a society of warrior women living in a land beyond the realms of the known world seemed fantastical. But then, archaeology stepped in and offered us a different perspective. In the 1990s, a series of graves were uncovered in the Eurasian steppe, specifically in areas around modern-day Russia and Kazakhstan, which dramatically changed our understanding of the Amazons. The graves contained the remains of women buried with weapons, including arrows and spears, as well as horse riding gear, equipment that mirrored what was described in the tales of the Amazons. Even more striking was the evidence of battle scars on the bones, including arrowheads lodged in the bodies, indicating that these women were not just buried with weapons for symbolic reasons. They were warriors who had actively participated in combat. These findings suggest that the myth of the Amazons might have been inspired by real warrior women from the Scythian culture, a nomadic group that inhabited these areas. This discovery has had a profound impact on how we interpret the myth of the Amazons. 
It suggests that the ancient Greeks may have had contacts with these warrior women, either through trade or warfare, and their stories were then woven into the rich tapestry of Greek mythology. We've journeyed from the walls of Troy to the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, from the touch of King Midas to the shores of the lost city of Helic. We've seen how the myth of the fierce Amazon women held a reality. These instances show us that the boundary between myth and reality is not as rigid as we might think. Indeed, our understanding of the past is an ever-evolving tapestry of fact, interpretation and storytelling. It reminds us that within every myth, there may lie a grain of truth waiting to be uncovered. Until next time, remember, the world is full of mysteries and our quest for knowledge is never-ending. What if I told you that beneath the shimmering waves of the Indian Ocean, there lies a submerged city that just might be a legendary kingdom mentioned in an ancient epic? Yes, we're going on a deep dive into the story of Dwarka, a city described in the Mahabharata, one of the major Sanskrit epics of ancient India. This isn't just an exploration of myth and legend, but also a journey through the fascinating realms of underwater archaeology and radiocarbon dating. So let's plunge into the depths and discover the captivating saga of Dwarka. Dwarka is more than just a name. It's a word that translates to the gateway to heaven. According to Hindu mythology, this majestic city was established by none other than Lord Krishna, a deity worshipped as the eighth avatar of Lord Vishnu. Now, who is Krishna, you might ask? Krishna, a central figure in Hinduism, is widely revered for his wisdom, his strategic prowess, his supernatural feats, and his role as a charioteer, advisor, and friend to Prince Arjuna in the epic Mahabharata. In this ancient text, Krishna flees to the western coast of India after a catastrophic war. Here he establishes the city of Dwarka, a city so opulent and grand that it's often described as a city made of gold. But as stories go, this magnificent city meets a tragic end. After Krishna's death, a series of calamities strike. Submerged by the sea in a matter of days, the city disappears, taking all its architectural grandeur and wealth along with it. The tale of Dwarka is fascinating in its own right, but here's where it gets even more interesting. This myth aligns with a geological phenomenon known as sea level rise, which could result in the submergence of coastal settlements. So this begs the question, is Dwarka just a symbolic tale or could it be an actual historical event dressed in myth and legend? The archaeology unit of the National Institute of Oceanography is making headlines. The team is embarking on an underwater archaeological expedition to see what lies beneath the sea at Dwarka, on the western coast of India. Led by archaeologists S.R. Rao and As Gaur, the team discovers something that shakes up the world of archaeology. Structural remains and artifacts suggesting the existence of an ancient city. The expedition reveals well-planned stone structures, pottery shards, semi-precious stones and inscriptions, some of which date back to the Harappan civilization around 2000 BCE. The discoveries don't stop there. Subsequent underwater explorations reveal an extensive network of stone structures, extending over half a mile, which appears to have been built on the bank of an ancient river, the Gomati. The stone structures, ceramics and inscriptions lend credibility to the existence of a bustling urban center in antiquity. It's an intriguing find, right? But there's a twist. The artifacts and structures found underwater not only suggest the existence of an ancient city, but also hint at a city that may have been submerged by rising sea levels, aligning strikingly with the legend of Dwarka. Could it be that the legend of Dwarka was not merely a legend, but a page out of our own historical past preserved in mythology? So we have established that there's something under the sea at Dwarka, but what exactly did the explorers find? Well, the discoveries at Dwarka were nothing short of astonishing. Firstly, pottery shards were found in abundance. These pieces of ancient ceramics were from a variety of different eras, some of them dating back to the late Harappan period. The variety in pottery styles suggests that Dwarka was inhabited over an extensive period of time, housing several generations of people. Then there were the semi-precious stones. These materials, often used for making jewelry, speak volumes about the economic prosperity of the city. The presence of such materials suggests that Dwarka was a trade center, exchanging goods with different parts of the ancient world. Next, there were the inscriptions. The most important of these 
was a seal that bore the image of a three-headed animal. The symbolism behind this creature remains a mystery, but the very fact that the inhabitants of Dwarka had a complex system of symbols suggests a sophisticated society, and then, of course, there were the architectural remains. Stone structures of various shapes and sizes were found, giving archaeologists a glimpse into the layout of the city. Among these structures, a series of circular fort-like constructions, believed to be part of the city's defense system, were particularly remarkable. Taken together, these discoveries form a remarkable narrative of an ancient city that was, in its time, a hub of civilization and commerce. And this narrative, much to our astonishment, aligns remarkably well with the mythical city of Dwarka described in the Mahabharata. In a world where we want hard facts, the science of radiocarbon dating can act as our time machine, providing an objective lens through which to view the past. And it was this scientific tool that was used to try and pinpoint the age of the submerged city of Dwarka. Radiocarbon dating works by estimating the age of organic materials, which include ancient artifacts and biological specimens. It's based on the principle that all living things contain carbon, some of which is radioactive C14. When a creature or plant dies, it stops absorbing this radioactive carbon, but the C14 it already contains continues to decay. By measuring the remaining quantity of C14, scientists can estimate how long ago the organism died, or in our case, when the artifacts were last used or made. Applying this technique, pieces of wood from Dwarka were sent to laboratories where they were analyzed for radiocarbon content. The results? The wood samples were found to date back to around 7,500 years ago, vastly predating the expected timeline of Mahabharata, according to most historians. This significant revelation opened up a Pandora's box of questions. Could the submerged city really be the mythical Dwarka? If so, does it mean that our timeline of the Mahabharata is off? Or does it suggest that the city was inhabited long before Krishna supposedly ruled there, and the epic merely borrowed the location's rich history? The radiocarbon dating results were a fascinating discovery, adding a new layer of complexity to the mystery of Dwarka. It reminds us that the lines between history, archaeology, and mythology can blur, leaving us to ponder on the intersection of fact and fiction. How does radiocarbon dating work? Let's step back from the Dwarka and elaborate a little more on this interesting way to measure age. All right, so imagine you're watching a video on YouTube. When the video starts, it's fully loaded, right? Now, let's say you pause the video and go grab a snack. When you come back, you notice that the video has unloaded a bit. It's been buffering and you can't play it right away. That's a bit like how radio carbon dating works. But instead of a video, we're talking about a kind of stuff called carbon-14. You see, everything that was once alive, like a tree, a dinosaur, or a woolly mammoth, absorbed a type of carbon called carbon-14 when they were living. Once they die, they stop taking in new carbon-14. But here's the cool part. Carbon-14 is a little bit like a slowly buffering YouTube video. Over time, it changes or decays into another kind of stuff called nitrogen-14. Scientists call the time it takes for half of the carbon-14 to change into nitrogen-14. It's half-life, kind of like if half your video had to buffer before you could watch it. For carbon-14, this half-life is about 5,730 years. Now, let's say we find a really old piece of wood and we want to know when the tree it came from stopped living. We can't ask the tree, obviously, but we can use a special tool to measure how much carbon-14 is still in the wood compared to how much carbon-12 a type of carbon that doesn't change over time, is in it. If there's a lot of carbon-14 left, the tree probably hasn't been dead very long, but if there's only a little carbon-14 left, that means the tree has been dead for a very long time, and that's pretty much how radiocarbon dating works. Scientists use this method to tell how old things are that used to be alive from ancient wooden tools to prehistoric animal bones. It's like a time machine that helps us uncover the secrets of the past, the discussion surrounding the ancient city of Dwarka isn't without its skeptics. These are the people who question the conclusions that have been drawn from the archaeological evidence, and their doubts are an important part of the scientific process. One of the main areas of skepticism revolves around the age of the underwater city. Critics point out that while certain samples tested using radiocarbon dating suggest an older date, this doesn't necessarily confirm that the city itself is of the same age. In other words, older organic material could have been incorporated into a younger settlement. 
Skeptics also point to the complexity and size of the structures that have been found underwater. They argue that these structures are far more sophisticated than what is typically associated with other sites from the same period. Some even suggest that the underwater ruins could be the remnants of a much more recent settlement, potentially even dating to medieval times. Then there's the question of the city's connection to the ancient epic, the Mahabharata. Skeptics argue that just because a city is found where the mythical Dwarka is said to have been, doesn't mean it's the same city. After all, there could have been multiple settlements in the area over the thousands of years of human history. Finally, skeptics argue that more research needs to be done. The underwater site is extensive, and only a small portion has been thoroughly investigated. Until more of the city is explored and more artifacts are found and tested, skeptics caution against drawing firm conclusions about the site's age and cultural significance. But where does that leave us? A submerged city? radiocarbon dates that point to immense antiquity, and a saga that may or may not be the echoes of a distant past. The quest for understanding Dwarka is a testament to the human spirit's insatiable curiosity, bridging the gap between myth and science. So the next time you gaze at the vast expanse of the ocean, remember that beneath its surface may lie stories waiting to be discovered. But as always, the journey towards knowledge is as fascinating as the destination itself. Pirates! Swashbuckling outlaws of the high seas, infamous for their rebellious lifestyle and thirst for treasure. But was pirate life really as it's portrayed in movies and books? Or was it perhaps a harsher reality fraught with danger and hardships? Today we're setting sail into the world of pirates, looking beyond the eye patches and parrots, and diving deep into the historical reality of pirate life. From their impressive ships, strict codes of conduct, and even the mystery surrounding their plundered riches. Let's embark on this maritime journey together. Let's delve deeper into the world of pirate ships. Contrary to popular belief, pirates didn't always sail the massive galleons we often see in films or storybooks. Those ships were incredibly large and slow, making them easy targets for naval forces and privateers. Instead, pirates often favoured smaller, faster vessels like sloops and brigs. Sloops were particularly popular for their speed and manoeuvrability. These single-masted vessels were quick and could easily navigate the coastal waters where pirates often found their prey. They could also escape into shallow waters, where larger naval vessels couldn't follow. Brigs, on the other hand, were slightly larger, boasting two masts. They were a bit slower than sloops but could carry more crew and cargo, making them ideal for longer voyages or larger pirate crews. Whichever type they chose, pirates would modify their ships to suit their needs. This often meant removing unnecessary cabins or structures to make room for more crew members and cargo. They would also mount cannons for both offence and defence, turning these relatively modest vessels into formidable warships. It's also worth noting that most pirate ships were not built but rather taken. Pirates would often seize a suitable ship during their raids, then modify it to suit their needs. This not only saved them the effort and resources of building their own ship, but it also allowed them to continually upgrade their vessel as they came across better and more powerful ships during their voyages. Maritime life in the golden age of piracy was far from the romanticised version we often see in popular culture. A discipline was harsh, and punishments for breaking the pirate code were brutal. These rules, often decided upon and agreed to by the crew, were necessary to maintain order on a ship full of ruthless men. The most well-known pirate punishment is probably walking the plank, but surprisingly, this is more myth than reality. While there are a few documented cases, it was not a common practice. Instead, pirates employed a variety of other punishments. Flogging was one of the more common methods of punishment. The wrongdoer would be tied up and whipped with a cat of nine tails, a whip made of nine knotted ropes. This brutal punishment could leave a man weak, bloody, and in some cases even dead, Keel-hauling was another horrific punishment. A rope would be tied to the sailor, who would then be thrown overboard. The rope was then pulled, dragging the unfortunate soul under the ship across the barnacle-covered bottom. This could result in severe lacerations and quite often drowning. Marooning was perhaps the most feared punishment of all. The offender would be left on a deserted island or a remote sandbar with little more than a bottle of water and a loaded pistol. The pistol was not for self-defence, but rather to offer the marooned pirate a quicker death than starvation or exposure. However, it wasn't all brute force. Sometimes punishments were psychological, 
Pirates would sometimes employ sweating, where the crew would chase the offender around the ship or up and down the mast until they were exhausted. These punishments were harsh, but pirates lived in harsh conditions and harsh times. Discipline was necessary to prevent chaos, and these severe punishments served as a stark reminder of the consequences of disobedience. Let's dive deeper into the life of a pirate. Far from the romanticized, swashbuckling adventurers of fiction, the reality of pirate life was tough, dangerous, and often short-lived. The typical pirate was a working-class man in his late twenties. Most pirates started their seafaring careers as legitimate sailors, fishermen, or privateers, which were basically legal pirates with a government contract. Life at sea was their trade, and when they turned to piracy, it was often for economic reasons. Simply put, piracy paid better. Pirate ships were small communities unto themselves, with their own rules and hierarchies. Each crew member had a role, from the captain and the quartermaster to the boatswain, gunner, and cook. Every man was expected to do his job, and in return, he received a share of any plunder. This was one of the more egalitarian aspects of pirate life. The loot was usually divided fairly, a stark contrast to the strict class divisions of mainstream society. The pirate's day would start at dawn, with the ship's bell signalling the beginning of the working day. The crew would work on maintaining the ship, navigating and looking out for potential prizes. Meals were simple and usually consisted of hardtack, a type of long-lasting biscuit, salted meat or fish, and grog, a mixture of rum and water. Despite the harsh conditions, pirates did find time for entertainment. Music was an essential part of pirate life, with shanties sung to keep rhythm during work and instruments played for evening entertainment. Pirates also gambled, although this was often banned while at sea due to the potential for fights. Another popular misconception is that pirates were constantly engaged in battle. In reality, most pirate attacks were more like muggings than battles. Pirates preferred to target weaker, undefended merchant ships and most of their victims surrendered without a fight. When they did fight, it was brutal and bloody with pirates using a mix of firearms and cutlasses. Pirate life was a combination of long periods of boredom, punctuated by intense moments of terror and excitement. It was a hard life, with the ever-present threat of death by disease, violence, or execution if captured. But for those who chose it, piracy offered a taste of freedom and adventure that was hard to find in the rigid society of the time. Ah, pirate treasure. It's the stuff of legends and probably what comes to mind when you think of pirates. Buried chests full of gold and jewels hidden on some deserted island waiting to be found. But how much of this is fact and how much is fiction? Firstly, let's talk about the loot. The primary goal of piracy was to obtain wealth, and pirates would target ships carrying valuable cargo. This could include gold and silver, but also items like spices, silk, tobacco, and even slaves. In fact, these goods were often more common than precious metals and gemstones, as they were the main commodities being transported across the seas during the Age of Exploration. Once a ship was captured, the pirates would take everything they could— this not only included the cargo, but also any personal valuables from the passengers and crew. In some cases, they would even take the clothes off their victims' backs. Everything had a value, and everything was divided among the crew according to their agreed shares. But what about burying the treasure? This is a staple of pirate law popularized by stories like Treasure Island. However, in reality, it was quite rare. Pirates lived a precarious and often short life with no guarantee of a future. When they got their hands on wealth, they tended to spend it quickly, often on drink, gambling, and women in port towns. Why bury your treasure when you could be spending it? There are a few documented cases of pirates burying their loot, but it was the exception rather than the rule. The most famous is probably Captain William Kidd, who buried part of his treasure on Gardner's Island, New York, in an attempt to use it as a bargaining chip when he was captured. As for the vast pirate hordes waiting to be discovered— they are likely just a myth. Most of the treasure that wasn't spent was probably lost at sea, scattered across the ocean floor with the many pirate ships that sank. So while the dream of finding a buried pirate chest is an exciting one, it's probably just that a dream. Life at sea, especially in the golden age of piracy, was an experience unlike any other. But was it all sea shanties and swashbuckling? Let's set sail into the realities of pirate life. Firstly, the ocean wasn't just a wide-open playground. It was, and still is, a treacherous place. 
pirates had to contend with storms, disease, shipwrecks, and other dangers, not to mention the constant threat of naval patrols and pirate hunters, the life expectancy for a pirate wasn't particularly high, and many met their end at the gallows or at the bottom of the sea. And then there was the daily routine. Contrary to the Hollywood image of pirates always engaged in battles or revelry, much of their time was spent on the monotonous tasks necessary to keep the ship sailing. This included cleaning, maintaining the ship, navigating and keeping watch. Pirates also had to ration their supplies, especially during long voyages. Their diet mainly consisted of hardtack, a type of hard, dry biscuit, salted meat and whatever fruits or vegetables they could keep from spoiling. Water was often scarce, and it wasn't uncommon for pirates to resort to drinking alcohol when their water supplies ran low. This led to a fair amount of drunkenness on board, which could cause its own set of problems. Living conditions were cramped, with the crew sleeping wherever they could find space. Hygiene was minimal at best, and disease was rampant. Scurvy, a disease caused by a deficiency of vitamin C, was a common affliction, as were other illnesses and infections. Medical treatment was rudimentary, and a serious injury or illness was often a death sentence. Despite these hardships, there was a certain sense of freedom that came with a pirate's life. They were outlaws, living outside the boundaries of society. They elected their own leaders, shared in their plunder, and lived by their own code. For some, this was a preferable alternative to a life of servitude on a naval or merchant vessel. However, the reality of life at sea was harsh, and not for the faint of heart. It was a life of constant risk, hardship, and danger, but for those who embraced it, it was a life of adventure, camaraderie, and the lure of untold riches, a pirate's life indeed. We've navigated through the tumultuous seas of pirate history, discovering that behind the romanticized depictions lie tales of hardship, survival, and a thirst for freedom. Pirates, in their own unconventional way, truly were masters of the sea, living life on their own terms outside societal norms, but their existence was far from the carefree, treasure-filled escapade often depicted. It was a life fraught with danger, disease, and the ever-looming shadow of a violent end. So, the next time you think about hoisting the Jolly Roger, remember it's not all sea shanties and buried treasure. And as always, remember to keep questioning, and as always, thanks for watching.